Hi, I'm Daniel Wright, and today I'm going to talk about using radiance caching to solve real-time global illumination. I'm going to talk about more than just radiance caching, though. I'm going to present an entire final gather. And this final gather is used in what we call Lumen. Lumen is our dynamic global illumination system in Unreal Engine 5. Lumen is targeting games on next generation consoles, and Lumen also has to scale up in quality to enterprise. So first, let me describe the problem that we're trying to solve in real time. This is the equation that we have to solve for every single pixel on the screen. The equation in plain English just says that the final pixel lighting is the integral over the incoming radiance times the BRDF. We're going to use the Monte Carlo formulation of the integral and estimate it with discrete samples. We're going to find the incoming radiance in a direction with ray tracing. The challenge with real-time ray tracing is that tracing rays is a very heavy operation. It's an incoherent tree traversal. And then because it's a two-level bounding volume hierarchy, wherever instances overlap in space, we have to trace through that segment of the ray redundantly. We can only afford, in general, about half of a ray per pixel, but we find that for good quality indirect lighting, we actually need hundreds. Outdoors needs about 100 rays per pixel, and indoors needs significantly more. So this makes indoors the much harder problem, and that's where we're going to focus most of our most of our development, and that's where we're going to look at quality, do com quality comparisons. So how can we make this real time? considering the huge gap between what we can actually afford at half of a ray per pixel and what we need for good quality at hundreds. Previous approaches mostly fall into two categories. The first one is irradiance fields. Irradiance fields ray trace from a small set of probes, which are arranged in world space grids. They pre-calculate irradiance at those probe positions, and then they interpolate to the full resolution pixels. Some implementations add probe occlusion to reduce leaking, but all irradiance field implementations suffer from leaking and over occlusion. The probe placement is very difficult because uh, that's where the irradiance is going to be calculated. And most implementations have a slow lane update to, to cover over some of these artifacts. And the algorithm produces a distinct flat look that comes from calculating irradiance at too low of a spatial resolution. The other big category of previous work is the screen space denoiser. These approaches trace rays from the individual pixels on the screen at a very small number of rays per pixel, usually one ray per pixel. And then they attempt to lower noise to acceptable levels with spatial and temporal reuse. Screen space denoisers can give very good quality, especially some of the recent work on recurrent blurs. But the problem with screen space denoisers is mostly happening before they even run. The input to the screen space denoiser is just too noisy in many indoor difficult cases. And the rays are traced with just a cosine distribution and a fixed sample rate. Noise is not constant. Near a bright light source, noise is less. And further from the bright light source, the noise increases as fewer and fewer of the rays actually hit that light source. The screen space denoiser can't do anything about this except just increase the amount of filtering, which reduces quality, because this, the denoiser is running after the sampling has been done. So our approach is different. Instead of tracing from every single pixel on the screen, we bundle up our rays and we trace from a, a much smaller set of pixels. This is effectively screen space radiance caching. This is downsampling the incoming radiance which works well because the incoming radiance is coherent, even though the geometry normals are not. So even though we downsampled incoming lighting, we still integrate with the BRDF at full resolution to get that full resolution indirect lighting quality. We also filter between the probes of our radiance cache instead of in screen space. And I'll talk more about the benefits that this gives later. We use better sampling in the first place we have an estimate of where the incoming lighting is coming from, and we send more rays in those directions 
this is important sampling in the incoming lighting. And we solve stable, we solve distant lighting with a separate sampling scheme through the world space radiance cache. And that gives us stable distant lighting. And I'll talk more about how we implement that later. So just to summarize all these differences, let's look at the input of the two algorithms. The screen space denoiser with two rays per pixel versus our screen space radiance cache at a half of a ray per pixel. Even with four times more rays, the input of the screen space denoiser is already so much noisier that it has a very hard job to do. In some cases, it is intractable, especially in difficult indoor cases. So now I'm going to talk about our final gather pipeline. The core of the final gather is the screen space radiance cache, and it's backed up by the world space radiance cache. The screen space radiance cache happens at a lower resolution than the final image, and the world space radiance cache is an even lower resolution from that. Interpolation from the radiance cache and integration are at full resolution, and so is the temporal filter at the end. So now I'm going to go into the steps that make up the screen space radiance cache. The screen probes are arranged in an at atlas. Each probe is unwrapped using an octahedral layout. We usually use a 8x8 resolution per probe. That's 64 traces per probe. And the octahedral layout gives us uniformly distributed world space directions. It's important that we use world space directions here because it means that neighbors have matching directions and we can find a matching direction in a neighbor very quickly. And that will become important later. I'll talk about why that's important later. After we do our tracing from the probes, we have radiance and hit distance, and we store those in the atlas for further processing. To actually place the screen probes, we start with a grid, a grid of every 16 pixels, and we place a probe every 16 pixels. You can see in orange the pixels whose interpolation failed after that first step. Then we double the resolution of the grid, and at each point, we test interpolation from the existing probes. Wherever the interpolation failed, we place a new probe. We then continue until uh, there are very few pixels whose interpolation failed, and then we use a flood fill for the final level. We don't want to continue all the way down to the individual pixel level, because then we would end up placing a probe, which is 64 traces, on an individual pixel. This algorithm is adaptive sampling. And to make this work in real time, we need to provide an upper limit. At the same time, we don't want to process our probes separately. We want them all to be processed together. So we place the adaptive probes at the bottom of the atlas. And when we run out of atlas space while we're placing probes, any pixels whose interpolation still failed will just rely on the flood fill. Because we're only placing on every nth pixel, uh, we need to temporally jitter our placement grid and our direction of arrays within the octahedral cell. We place our screen probes directly on the pixels on the screen to make sure that there's no leaking, no gap between the, the pixel and the probe. Um, but because we place them directly on the screen, we have to hide occlusion differences within the screen cell with a temporal filter. And I'll talk more about some of the side effects that that has later. To interpolate from the screen space radiance cache to the pixels on the screen, we weight the, pro the radiance probes by their distance from the pixels plane, the plane derived from the pixels position and normal. This prevents the foreground misses from leaking onto the background. We also jitter the offset into the interpolation from the radiance cache, but we only apply the jitter if the jitter position still lies in the same plane as the original pixel. And that's very important because it makes sure that the jitter itself does not cause the interpolation to fail. The jitter distributes the differences in lighting between the probes spatially. It also temporally stabilizes the final lighting by expanding the temporal anti-aliasing's neighborhood clamp. So given this screen space radiance cache pipeline that I've described so far, we can crank up the number of rays, the, the number of directional rays, and crank up the spatial resolution and find that it matches the path tracer. So we've implemented everything correctly. But when we turn it down to our budget of a half of a ray per pixel, it's much too noisy indoors. 
So next I'm going to describe some techniques that we use to reduce the noise while not increasing our budget of a half of a ray per pixel. The first one is important sampling. So going back to the Monte Carlo formulation of the rendering equation, we'd like to distribute our rays proportional to the functions that we're integrating. But how can we estimate what these are, especially considering that the incoming lighting is what we're trying to solve in the first place? Well, it turns out that we have a very good estimate of the incoming lighting just by looking at last frames, screen, space, radiance cache. Instead of having to do an expensive screen space search last frame, we can just reproject the current screen position into last frame and average the four neighboring screen probes. The rays in the radiance cache are already indexed by position and direction. And that, that's what makes that search fast. Wherever the reprojection fails, like the position was off screen last frame or occluded, we can just fall back to the world space radiance cache. On the bottom right, you can see uh, what the incoming lighting looks like in an octahedral layout. And for this probe, it's mostly coming from these three general directions. For the BRDF, we can just accumulate the BRDF from all the pixels that will actually use this screen probe after interpolation. And we know the BRDF for those pixels from the G buffer. For a probe that's placed on a flat wall, about half of the rays will end up having a BRDF of zero. So we don't need to trace any rays in those directions, and we'd like to reassign those rays to important directions. But even better than important sampling either of these functions individually, we would like to important sample their product. And this is where structured important sampling comes in. Structured important sampling assigns a small number of samples to hierarchically structured areas of the probability density function. It achieves a good global stratification, but the sample placement algorithm in the paper requires offline processing. However, we can still reuse the hierarchical thresholding idea. And we find that it maps perfectly to our octahedral MIP quad tree. On the left, we've calculated the product between the incoming lighting and the BRDF. And on the right, we've subdivided our octahedral layout wherever the product, wherever the PDF was high. To integrate this structured important sampling into our octahedral probe pipeline, first we, we need to add an indirection to our tracing lanes. This will make it so that our uh, tracing threads will know what direction they should trace in. After we do our tracing and we calculate radiance, we need to composite the radiance from the non-uniform layout into the uniform probe layout for the final integration. And here's the actual ray generation algorithm to implement structured important sampling in a compute shader. First, we calculate the product between the BRDF and the lighting for each octahedral texel. We start with uniformly distributed probe ray directions to make sure that when we go to do the tracing, every single thread in the thread group is doing something. Then we sort our rays by their PDF. And for every three rays whose PDF is below our call threshold, we refine and super sample the matching high PDF ray. So you can see on the left in the BRDF, wherever the BRDF was zero, we've called all those rays well, almost all of them, and we've reassigned them to the directions where the product between the BRDF and the lighting was the highest. And here's what that looks like in the world. On the left, we're looking at the uniform ray directions where half of those rays were just wasted intersecting the wall immediately, and they'll never be used in the final lighting. And on the right, we've reassigned those rays to the important incoming lighting directions. And you can already see in this view mode how much, how much less noise there is with the important sampling. But we can make some improvements to this algorithm. Instead of calling rays whose lighting PDF is low, we only call rays whose BRDF is low. That's because the lighting PDF is just an approximation and is subject to noise. We might have missed that small bright light source last frame, but we still need to make sure we trace a ray in that direction. The BRDF, on the other hand, is accurate. It's coming from the G-buffer, and it's generally noise-free. We can also call much more aggressively by leaning on the spatial filter 
we can call rays with a greater than zero BRDF and then reduce their weight during the spatial filter, which reduces darkening around corners. So this lets us take more unimportant rays and reassign them to important lighting directions. And here's what we get out of the important sampling. With the exact same budget of a half of a ray per pixel, we have significantly less noise. We just traced our rays in smarter directions. Here's a summary of the ideas that make this work. We guide this frame's rays with last frame's lighting, and we guide this frame's rays with the distant lighting. We bundle our rays into probes, and that lets us forward smarter sampling and allows us to find last frame's lighting very efficiently. So now I'm going to talk about how we do spatial filtering with the screen space radiance cache. Instead of filtering in, in screen space, we filter within the radiance cache. So we're reading from the radiance cache atlas and writing to it at the same time. Because the radiance cache, screen space radiance cache is downsampled, this lets us implement very large spatial filters for cheap. A three by three kernel in the probe space is the same screen size as a 48 by 48 kernel in screen space. And while we're filtering incoming radiance, we can just ignore normal differences because incoming radiance is not affected by normal. We only need depth weighting on the neighbor radiance. When we go to gather from our neighbors, we can very quickly find the radiance that matches the direction we're trying to gather, the direction we're trying to gather to, because they're already indexed by position and direction being in a radiance cache but we need some kind of heuristic to reject the neighbor radiance values when they would have caused leaking. And we can do this by reprojecting the neighbor ray hits and calculating the angle between that reprojected position and the direction we're considering and rejecting any radiance that falls far enough away from the direction we're considering. This effectively filters distant lighting while preserving local shadowing. Looking at what the, this spatial filtering is actually doing, we find that without tracing any additional rays, it does a very good job of reducing noise on flat surfaces, but we have lost some of the contact shadows between the folds of the towel. This is happening because the angle error biases toward distant lighting. Distant lighting has no parallax and therefore never gets rejected and that introduces leaking. The solution that we found is to just clamp the neighbor hit distance to our own hit distance before we do the reprojection. And this still gives us extremely smooth distant lighting, but we get back the contact shadows between the folds of the towel and between the towel and the wall. And here's a final comparison of what the probe space spatial filtering is doing without tracing any more rays. So now I'm going to talk about our world space radiance cache. The problem that we run into with just tracing from the screen space probes is that we have a lot of noise from distant lighting. The noise from a small bright feature increases with the distance to that feature. And at the same time, those long incoherent traces are slow, so we can't just do more traces. Distant lighting is changing very slowly, both in time and in space. And that's an opportunity to cache across frames. And that's an opportunity to reuse those distant rays for neighboring screen probes. The solution that we use is a separate sampling scheme for the distant lighting. We use a world space radiance cache for the distant lighting, just like in the Technology of the Tomorrow Children by James McLaren. The world space radiance cache has stable error because the probes are placed in world space, and that means it's easy to hide. Here's where the world space radiance cache fits into our, our final gather pipeline. The screen space radiance cache uses it for distant lighting. We place those world space probes around the screen probes that are going to interpolate from them. And then we trace rays to calculate incoming radiance from the world space probes. And then we interpolate that radiance to solve the distant lighting for the screen probe rays. We're effectively connecting two rays here. Well, there are multiple world probe rays because of interpolation, but we can just look at one world probe ray and uh, consider how they connect. 
when we trace the world probe rate, we need to add an, an offset to the start to make sure that we skip the interpolation footprint. Any positions within the interpolation footprint are going to use this world probe ray for distant lighting, and we need to make sure we don't pick up any local lighting. When we trace the screen probe ray and connect it with the world probe ray, we need to make sure the screen probe ray covers first the interpolation footprint, and then secondly, the distance that the world probe ray skipped. But with what I've described so far, we are going to encounter leaking. This happens because the two rays were traced from different origins, and there's a gap between them. The world space probe radiance should have been occluded, but it wasn't because of this incorrect parallax. And you can see on the right, um, you can see the leaking that happens. And we can solve this by just using the world space probe ray whose origin best matches up with our screen probe ray instead of the world space probe ray whose direction matches. This is accepting some directional error, and, but making sure that there's no gap between the rays, which reduces leaking. And if we go back, you can see how much leaking there was before, and that it's now solved by using this simple sphere parallax. Our world space radiance cache is sparse. We want to place the probes only where they're going to be used by the screen space probes. So we store them in a 3D and 3D clip map grids that are centered around the camera. And these clip maps are just storing an indirection into the probe atlas. The clip map distribution gives us a bounded screen size. That's important because we don't want to place too many or too few world space probes based on what's on the screen. Our octahedral probe atlas is storing radiance and trace distance after tracing, just like before except this time we have a much higher resolution per probe because there, there are many fewer world space probes than screen probes. To, to actually implement the placement and the caching, um, first we mark any position that we're, go that we're gonna interpolate from later in the clip map in directions. For each marked position, which is a, a world space probe, we can either reuse traces from last frame or if there aren't any available, we're going to allocate a new spot in the atlas and trace new rays. We also retrace a subset of those reused traces, those cache hits, just to propagate lighting changes. But the problem we run into with this algorithm, as described so far, is that it hitches. We have a highly variable cost, and anytime the camera moves quickly and or comes around a corner, revealing a lot of new uncached positions, we will trace a lot of rays. But we can, we can give an upper bound on this cost by specifying a fixed budget for full resolution traces. Any additional traces over the budget, which are for the purpose of cache misses, can still be done, but at a lower resolution. And any additional traces over the budget that were for the purpose of lighting updates, we can just skip those completely until we're back under budget. And this gives us a bounded maximum cost and makes it work in real time. Just like with the screen probes, we can do important sampling, except that this time we do not have a good estimate of the incoming lighting. We can still important sample according to the BRDF. We accumulate the BRDF from the screen probes, and then we dice up our probes into trace tiles. Because we're tracing at a much higher resolution, we can't afford to sort individual rays so we operate on trace tiles. We generate these trace tiles with resolution proportional to the BRDF. That's running structured important sampling again, except this time on, on trace tiles. We only super sample trace tiles near the camera, and the super sampling gives us effectively 4,000 traces per world space probe. That, is, that gives us extremely stable distant lighting, especially when you compare it to the one ray per pixel that a screen space denoiser had to work with. Once again, after we do our tracing, we can do spatial filtering between the probes in the radiance cache. The problem that we run into this time is that we cannot assume mutual visibility between probes. The neighbor probe may have been placed on the other side of a wall. Ideally, we'd like to retrace the neighbor path through our probe depths, the depths that we stored off when we did our ray tracing. But this, is, this turns out to be too expensive we found that just doing a single occlusion test to a position along the neighbor ray path 
works well to reduce leaking while giving us spatial reuse. And this occlusion test is nearly free because we're not tracing any new rays. We're just reusing the probe depths that we captured when we did our probe tracing. Here are the results of the World Space Radiance Cache. Here we're using the Screen Space Radiance Cache for the first two meters and then the World Space Radiance Cache for any lighting further than that. The biggest benefit of the World Space Radiance Cache is that it has greatly improved our temporal stability. We also use the World Space Radiance Cache to guide the screen probe important sampling. We use it on hair and some forward shading, indirect light on forward shading, and we use it to improve the quality of our multi-bounce algorithm. So now I'm going to talk about the full resolution steps of our final gather. These are the bent normal, interpolation, integration, and the temporal filter. Going back to the integral, remember that now we've calculated incoming radiance at a lower resolution in our screen space radiance cache, and we need to do the integration at full resolution to get the, all the geometric details. One way to implement this is to important sample the BRDF to get directions and then sample our radiance cache, our octahedral atlas to get radiance. But those are incoherent fetches, so we can't afford very many. And as a result, we have noise in the integration. We can use mitmaps of the radiance cache radiance, which is called filtered important sampling, but that causes self-lighting. It pulls lighting from behind the hemisphere into the front of the hemisphere. What we do instead to get higher quality is we use spherical harmonics for our diffuse integration. So we convert the octahedral radiance into spherical harmonic form in the radiance cache at a lower resolution, and then the full resolution pixels just load the SH coefficients, which is a coherent load. And then we do the SH diffuse integration, which is very cheap and gives us high quality. We can also do something for rough specular. Ray trace reflections become very expensive at high roughness, and they're expensive because they require tracing additional rays. And if you think about the GGX lobe at high roughness, it converges on diffuse. It becomes very wide. So instead of tracing additional rays for high roughness materials, we can just reuse our screen space radiance cache. We generate directions from important sampling in the GGX lobe. And then instead of tracing new rays, we just sample our screen space radiance cache. This is automatically leveraging all of the sampling and filtering work that we already did. Next problem we run into is that our downsampled tracing loses contact shadows. We can solve this or at least mitigate it with a full resolution bent normal, that is directional occlusion. We compute the bent normal with fast screen traces whose distance, trace distance, is tied to the distance between our screen probes. We then integrate this full resolution bent normal with the screen space radiance cache using the heuristics in horizon-based indirect lighting. This treats the screen probe GI as the far field irradiance, and the bent normal represents the amount of near field irradiance, and the multi-bounce approximation from the paper gives us the near field irradiance. Here's what it looks like if we apply that bent normal to our screen space radiance cache we get back the contact shadows that we were missing. And we have uh, full resolution ge geometry details and small objects look like they belong on the, on the ground again. Moving on to our temporal filter, remember that we had to jitter probe positions since we're not placing probes on every single pixel on the screen. And that jittering requires a reliable temporal filter to hide. So we're going to use depth rejection for our temporal filter instead of neighborhood clamp. Depth rejection gives stable results, but it's also very slow to react to lighting changes. And that manifests as streaking behind moving objects, where the indirect lighting is not, is not updating fast enough to account for the object's movement. We can improve this by tracking the hit velocity along with the depth when we do our tracing.
we can then calculate the projected area of each probe that belongs to the fast moving object. We're, we're, we can then switch to a fast update mode in our temporal filter for any pixel coming from a probe that mostly hits fast moving objects. So we're effectively lowering the strength of our temporal filter and raising the strength of our spatial filter for any pixels whose, mo whose lightning is mostly coming from fast moving objects. So now I'm going to talk about the performance of our final gather. On a PlayStation 5 console at 1080p internal resolution with temporal super resolution outputting at 4K, we achieve a cost of 3.7 milliseconds for the whole final gather. And that's at a budget of a half of a ray per pixel. About half of that cost comes from tracing the rays and the other half comes from probe placement and interpolation and integration. We can scale down this final gather just by reducing the resolution of the radiance caches and also disabling the bent normal. And that gets us down to an eighth of a ray per pixel, which only costs 2.1 milliseconds. And here's what that eighth of a ray per pixel looks like compared to a half of a ray per pixel. The eighth of a ray per pixel is less temporally stable, but the biggest difference is that it is lacking the contact shadows from the bent normal. So we're scaling down very effectively to low, lower numbers of rays per pixel. Here are some other images at half of a ray per pixel. We're getting very good quality indirect lighting in these very geometrically complex organic scenes. But with the exact same algorithms and the exact same budget of a half a ray per pixel, we're also getting good indirect lighting quality in clean indoor architecture. We can crank up our number of rays per pixel to two, and this still runs quickly on a high-end PC. And now we're getting extremely high quality, real-time global illumination. All these final gather techniques that I described provide the final gather for Lumen in Unreal Engine 5. Lumen is solving dynamic global illumination, shadowed skylighting, and lighting from emissive meshes. This is just the final gather for opaque materials, and uh, indirect lighting on transparency and volumetric fog are provided through a separate technique. The final gather also provides rough specular, and that integrates with Lumen's ray trace reflections to cover the whole roughness range of any material. You can find documentation for Lumen at docs.unrealengine.com. And one thing that I didn't mention about this final gather so far, but it's very important, is that it supports any type of ray tracing. So Lumen has multiple types of ray tracing, including software ray tracing through sparse sign distance fields. And we can use the exact same final gather regardless of whether we're doing software ray tracing or hardware ray tracing. For future work, we'd like to improve the quality of disoccluded areas. We'd also like to improve temporal stability in highly dynamic scenes where we turn down the strength of the temporal filter and raise the spatial filter. We'd also like to apply this screen space radiance cache to our surface cache to improve the quality of our multi-bounce GI. And here are the references from this talk. And thank you very much for joining me.